HBCU Digest Radio, welcome back to our ongoing conversation uh, with executives, faculty, staff, students at historically black colleges and universities. Today, our distinguished guest is Joan G. Wilmer. She is the rector of the Norfolk State University Board of Visitors, the first woman uh, and graduate of Norfolk State University, we must add, to lead that board in 20 plus years and part of an executive committee that is predominantly female, which is also history making for the institution. She joins us this morning to talk about uh, the up, uh, updates on the presidential search for the institution and some of the uh, positive things happening at the school uh, that will lead it to greater heights in the uh, years and uh, decades to come. So, Madam Rector, it is a pleasure to have you on this morning. Well, it's a pleasure to join you, and I really um, appreciate your platform for the HBCU community. So thank you so much, and kudos on the great job you're doing. That is so nice when you get cursed out so often. It, it's always <laughs> a, a treat to, 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 have, to have kind words, so thank you so much. First, can you can you give us the, the emotion you have, uh, of course, being a graduate of Norfolk State, being able to, to come back home, so to speak, to lead its board of visitors, and not only that, but to make history as the first woman uh, to lead the institution's board in 20 plus years. Wow, um, what a loaded question. Uh, let me tell you, every time I come to campus for an event, um, for an appearance, for a meeting, I actually tear up. And that's because Norfolk State gave me a voice and confidence at a time where um, I didn't know who Joan was going to be. Um, if I may share, I was a little girl from White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. Um, that was predominantly um, Caucasian community, um, but beautiful community, absolutely beautiful, loving, small town, country community. And when I decided to come to Norfolk State, I really wanted to come to an institution that would help me understand more of who I was as a black female. And um, when I came to Norfolk State, I remember the day my mother, the late Pastor Joan Wilmer, drove me in a rented van that she could only afford for the day. And it was myself and my sisters and my brothers, because there's six of us, and we were all piled in this van, and I only had a crate of stuff because nobody in my college, I mean, in my family had gone to college, and so it was one of those um, very rare experiences, but my mom was full of faith, Pastor Wilmer, led by God. She was just like, you know what? We're going to college. I don't know what this means, but we're going to college. And the day she took me, we arrived five minutes after five at the housing department. And they said, we can't take you until the next day. And my mother was very upset, and she rode around because she could not afford to rent the van for one more day. That's how much of a humble beginning that I had. And we rode around, and we went to the salon to um, just stop in and ask me some questions about the community. How my mother picked this one salon out of the tons of salons in the Norfolk area. And the lady said, my sister is the head of international studies at Norfolk State University. Wow. And she said, let me call her. She calls Dr. Bertha Tia Scoffrey. An hour later, here comes a lady in a big red hat, a big red suit she had on and all this really stopped and uh, her husband walked in behind her with a, a Bill Cosby sweater and a Kango hat and she said don't worry I got your daughter and it was from there to my mom I guess got the confirmation that it was okay for me to go with her and it was at that moment when I realized the community and family strength of Norfolk State University. Dr. Scoffrey took me in her home that evening. The next day she took me to Walmart. My, mom, my mother didn't know that I needed toiletries and, and comforters and all this kind of stuff. She gave me my first work-study job. The campus and the professors gave me scholarships so I could stay in school because I was an out-of-state student. And it was at those moments when I realized that my, my future was bigger than um, just going to college. And Norfolk State played a key role. So when I go to campus, um, I think about those humble beginnings. I think about the support I got from the staff, from Dr. Bertha T. Scott-Free, from those who continue to be a part of my life in Norfolk State. So when I serve, I serve with only that university because that university cared about me when I was a stranger. You know, it, it's it's that kind of story that, that makes the HBCU experience more than worthwhile. Um, it makes it yeah. almost essential uh, to black it folks or, or any kind of people. But as a as a board leader, and I also say you've actually made history with the Digest because you are the first board member or board chair 
to actually come on this show. Um, so that shows you how bold the sisters are in, in, in sharing. Wow. Wow. Um, wow. I would say, but how do you translate that, that experience, that culture of family, which we all know so well from a board perspective, how do you look at the, the direction of an institution and say, this is how we ensure that students know that this is what they can get. And this is the benefit of attending Norfolk state. How do you communicate that to donors? How do you communicate that back to alumni to say now invest in the institution? How do you do that to the corporate community? Is there a way to distill that down to something that is, I, I guess, data in a data format or, or some kind of narrative that makes people know this is more than a worthy institution. It's an essential institution. Absolutely. You know, I look at that experience um, coupled with what I've been doing for the last 20 plus years. And I've been an HR executive um, for some very big global brands. And in my role, I'm usually the one that goes in and turns around um, institutions or help to rebuild them um, in their leadership teams and their um, infrastructure. So um, as we are going through this change, really, it's almost divinely lined up and it helps me to think about okay so how do we think about the 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 business of education which has become very much a business and then put more forefront the the people that really are the product of the business so how do we put in the front of um, Norfolk State again the refocus around what today what today's learner looks like um, what today's learner needs what today's learner and student um, crave for as they try to find their voice. The times then versus now, they're different. Um, but what hasn't changed is that there's a person. And so when I come to the meetings and I talk to the board or the board talks to me because I tell you we're a great team, great team of executives that come together to support this school, it's about um, what is that student focus? Um, not only what are we doing to bring the students in, but what are we doing to help them graduate? Um, I don't look too much at enrollment numbers. I want to see the bottom line. Where's our graduation rate? Um, what are we doing to support students to help them stay in school, whether it be financially or the resources and tools that are needed? And so when we pull together our metrics, and um, the team will tell you I'm very much a numbers person, and we try to understand the story and the journey of students, and I keep in the back of my mind that little girl from West Virginia who wore sundresses and didn't know her voice, I couple that with today's world and today's student and what they're challenged with and think about what are the governance points, the policies, the financial resources, the support that we as a board can give to our university president and our faculty and staff so that they become vested and motivated to take care of that student. If it's not about the student, at the end of the day, you lose a viable commodity. Listen, I was an out-of-state student. My mother had no money for college. If it wasn't for me pushing along, me seeking out resources, and then garnering the favor and support of others who gave me scholarships, I wouldn't have stayed at Norfolk State University. It would have been easy for me to go to West Virginia, but because I was so tied to the school and my spirit and soul felt like that was home, um, I try to think about that as we make governance decisions with our board. You talked about the support that you can give to the president and the campus at large. And so often the narrative that is associated with HBCUs is that our, our greatest weaknesses, whether this is right or wrong, is that is boards is that they they don't fundraise uh they can be too uh interfering in operations of a, of an institution um this is something that i'm sure you've seen you know as an observer of the sector and having served on the board and even in the interim leadership capacity what do you think is the secret for a board to one know its role and avoid interference in institutional matters and two to embrace the heavy lifting of the role, which is the fundraising and the advocacy and the political maneuvering and all that? I think the, the key is, one, a board that's solid and knows the role of governance um, and shared governance. And what does that mean? And making sure that there's a common understanding around that that's embraced and valued amongst those members. Um, we have a new board. Essentially, um, we have five new members, 
um, that are on the board. So when you think about the dynamics of a 13-person board, um, that's essentially a, a new team that has come in with um, some of the terms that have expired for those who have served on the board. So we're in the process of pulling the board together and, and thinking about, you know, how we want to continue to serve and support given how we want to redefine the HBCU experience. And as we're doing that to solidify ourselves and search for a pre president, we're also looking at a leader. Um, HBCUs, as you've seen, have gone through many iterations of change, and um, certain leaders were brought in um, to do things to help the university uh, with their um, infrastructure and some of their operational challenges so that it can continue to stand. And then um, you have some leaders who are brought in to help it reimagine its strategy and its position and presence in the education sector for the future. That's where we are. We're in the process of thinking about how will Norfolk State be that mighty behold green and gold for the future. And so that comes from leadership because the only person that we really interact with, I would say, on a day-to-day -day basis or, or anything that we try to manage from a governance, um, financial or policy-wise, is to the president. So as we're searching for this president, we're looking for someone who understands the business of education, but who also understands the needs of the sector and has an interest and a hunger to reimagine the HBCU experience. And through that trusted relationship, and that's the key, anyone will tell you that, it's that relationship where you feel like you have the confidence um, of a leader who understands the complexity of an HBCU presidency, which is very different than a private institution. Mm -hmm. um, they have a lot of balls that they have to throw in the air, and that he or she has the ability and the support, which this person will from Norfolk State, um, to build and strengthen the team where there's leaders and executives in place that can carry it forward. Um, that's how you have a good marriage. You have star players. You go in there, and you go in there to win it. And Norfolk State University is at a place right now. We're ready, we're ready to position ourselves for the next chapter of winning. We've done a great job withstanding the elements of the, the, the I would say, the environment of HBCUs. Right. And, and what it was back in the, H, the Harrison B. Wilson days, um, which was one of our great presidents, is not the same as what the president will have to deal with today. And so our seventh president, I'm counting on is going to do some amazing things that will help us be stronger as partners. Can you give us some updates on where that search stands? And, and, and if you don't mind me asking, how do you as a board member figure out that fit for president? And I'm not talking about, a, you know, an area of specialty or, you know, male or female, but more so. Is it something that you say we need a president who can do X, Y and Z? And are there, I guess, phases that you want to see growth? Is it total institutional growth? Um, is it, you know, we need a fundraiser now. And, when you know, when we reach those benchmarks, maybe we want to shift that person over to academic development. Then maybe we want to shift over to recruitment. Are there phases of it? Are there uh, is it just overall? How do, what is that? What is that process like about finding the fit of a president? So I'm going to answer in reverse. Um, so let me talk about the, the presidency. Um, I think it's about an executive who understands organizations and how to build within an institution a team that moves forward. Um, as I mentioned before, I've been in human resources for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. I my, my primary partners are CEOs and one and two levels down. Mm -hmm. um, they lead the division. So I'm constantly looking at executive talent and competencies and depth in their um, sectors that they lead and looking at their ability to tap into talent to build the best team. I think in the past, um, not necessarily reflective just of Norfolk State University, but I think of other HBCUs, they look at um, presidents to carry the weight by themselves. Now, that's not possible. We don't do that in corporate. Um, we look at executives who have the leadership gravitas, the presence, who understand how to connect the dots and bring the best out of people, who know how to lead influence through people, who understand that through everything, whether it's your institution or the political leaders, the community partners, or those pipelines of students, it's all about relationships and presence, as well as someone who understands what it means for the education sector today and how to carve out 
a soul and a presence that's unique for your institution and brand that you put forth, that individual is what's going to win the game. They're going to surround themselves with people who, um, who get it and who can help be a part of a team. And that's important. I think, you know, over time we just put a pressure here or pressure there to answer a situation that's in a moment. And with Norfolk State University, we're looking at the holistic picture. We're looking at the strategic um, down the road um, point where we can be and beyond. And that's going to take a leader that understands how to build that team and have others there. So when you speak to fundraising, when you speak to um, community partnerships, when you think about the, the life cycle of student um, recruitment to graduation point to post graduation because the relationship is lifetime. That individual will know how to bring to put the players together to make it happen, and that's how you win. Mm-hmm. As far as our presidential search, um, our, our board of visitors, um, did I tell you they're great? And I'm <laughs> saying that so passionately. Um, we have a, a great um, roster of um, members who are part of the Board of Visitors who love Norfolk State, but they come with very strong expertise. Mm-hmm. Um, we have established a 21-person presidential search committee, and you say, wow, 21 people. Yes, 21 people, because we realize this person is going to meet the community around them. Right. We have taken it back to the core of, of relationships. So that presidential search committee has everyone from the community, definitely the alumni community, um, our president of the alumni community. Hi, James. Um, Does an amazing job representing the voice. Uh, We also have our BOV members. We have um, past faculty and staff. We work together to think about the profile, and we've done so by going out to the community, literally a road show, Jared, to get feedback on what have you seen and what would you like to see and what do we need to establish a profile that works for us. We have retained Greenwood Asher and Associates as consultants for the presidential search, um, amazing partners. They have worked with a number of institutions. Um, what I like about Greenwood Asher, amongst many things, is that they have really helped us to think up to our own voice. So we're really leading our search. They're partners to facilitate what our desired profile in um um, for the individual to be. We actually have um, two of our members of the Board of Visitors leading the presidential search. Uh, Dr. Deborah DeCochi, who was our vice rector, amazing leader, CEO of the Heaven to Roads Foundation, um, has an amazing resume, but she's been a college president, so she gets it. And that expertise helps us a lot to think beyond um, our actions thus far on how we can put, pick a stellar president. Mm-hmm. And then we have um, Larry Griffiths, um, who's also an executive on the team, and two of them have been amazing to lead this 21-person search committee. And then, you know, we have I'd say for, the, for a long time, and, and we've purposefully taken our time um, to look for a president carefully to select someone. We've gone through these steps of reaching out, looking in, being introspective, thinking about competency very clearly, um, a profile of success, and as we've been looking at candidates, we've been taking this roadmap to say what is the right individual. And the world is full of talented people. Let me tell you, we're so excited about what the future holds as we go through this process. Do you have a, I guess, a timetable you've identified as when you'd like to have somebody announce? Well, we're hoping that we have someone announce this year. Um, the time is a guess floating as we are searching for the candidate. As I mentioned before, um, our key goal is to select the right person. Mm -hmm. Um, That's the way the board leads, and that's the way I lead the board. Um, It is not a race, because that person's going to be in place. Um, Our plans are for them to be in place for a long time, and so this board invested in making sure that we have the right individual, and the good thing is we have um, our partners from the administration in Virginia who are helping to make sure that we are supported in that process so that we can, again, set Norfolk State University up for its future. When you think about uh, an institution's assets, so to speak, Norfolk State has quite a bit of them. Uh, So you have academic strength in uh, computer science and natural science and cybersecurity. You have uh, strength in in mass communications, uh, strength in uh, education, strength in athletics. So there's so many positive things to sell about the institution. Um, Is that something that as a as a board chair? particularly, or board rector, I should say, I'm sorry, that you 
try to emphasize, especially with an interim president, like, hey, you know, we're, we're working towards this, but we have some things that we got to go out there and move and push to the community. Is that is that something that you personally say is a thing that has to be done and then a person comes in and, and just gets on board or does a person come in and, and set a new agenda for you? Well, it's interesting you say that. So we've been going through this process of our strategic plan, which is on the website and thinking about our future. And as we work with our interim president, um, President Melvin Stitt, who has done an amazing job, mm-hmm. um, as I call, holding up the banner and keeping things going as we get a new president in and who loves Norfolk State, um, he has continued the charge around building our academic program. Um, so what does that look like? It's um, taking where we've put a good stake in the ground uh, with our cybersecurity program, um, being a part of some key platforms for the state of Virginia and beyond. Um, in that space, taking legacy programs where we've had um, award-winning recognition with our nursing program, our school of social work program, um, and thinking about that in where have we had success that we continue to promote success, and where can we carve out new niches of uh, um, opportunity for the future, like our new um, uh, arts program mm-hmm. that we have where performing arts is going to be an area that you'll see more of a focus at Norfolk State University. And so as we pull together this strategic plan, it was done in the spirit of how do we set this up to where a new president can come in and bring their vision, that we're not putting them in the box, we we'll give them in the room to breathe and bring their innovation because we want to think beyond ourselves. The answer is not just with a the team that's in place. It's with the individuals and the new mindsets that you bring to the table. And so although we recognize that we have some strength in these um, areas of um, academia, we realize that we can grow beyond that, strengthen our program, and produce a winning product that today's learner wants to be a part of. They want to be a part of something they know that there's a formula of success. That new president is going to have an opportunity to be a part of defining what that looks like and influence in the direction of that strategic plan, which will be to build upon the program that we have in Norfolk State University. And the great thing about it, we have a faculty and staff and an executive administration that are 200% on board. And they know that we have a bright future. And with their hard work and support of this new president, I, I'm just I'm excited talking about it. I know we're going to be amazing. I can't wait to come back to you after this president comes on board for a few years and say, Jared, guess what we did? <laughs> and then the last question, I mean, you've obviously excited and knowledgeable about the school. It's your alma mater. Uh, what will what would you say to the point that you just made five years from now? that you say, hey, guess what we did, and guess what, we did it. What would be the, the signal of, of success at Norfolk State? Uh, because there, there are, again, there, there are so many good things happening. There's so much positive. It's not like you're starting from the ground floor, like you're already executing in a lot of areas. So what what is a demonstration of success at the, at the school five years from now? We wanna to continue to um, make more success out of those areas that we are already achieving great success. You know, this school has done amazing work. Um, so how do we continue with those successes? And, you know, uh, it's it, a conscious thought around what do we do to get here and what do we do to stay here in those particular areas. It's also um, five years from now we have Norfolk State um, continuing to be stronger and to have a team in place that will help usher in, I'll say, the next generation of existence with this seventh president. We have a seventh president who has been successfully onboarded, immersed in the communities in which we have a presence and want to have a presence, and helping the school to realize its growth, whether it be growth in resources, growth in students, and more importantly, growth in our graduation rate. Um, And then last but not least, it's a um, point in five years where people have another um, level of pride of Norfolk State University. So whether you're the alumnus who went to Norfolk State University in the 60s or 70s, or you've graduated um, just this year in 2019, that the pride and support and reinvestment you make back in your institution all align because you see 
what the future holds for Norfolk State. You know, we have uh, Dr. Deborah Fontaine speaks to um, our uh, our new logo and our, our branding. We see the future in you, and um, it really is not just about the students. It's about the community and the alumni, and um, hopefully in five years, um, everyone will realize that to a greater level and will make Dr. Fontaine proud with all the work that she and her team are doing, and that will be in that stronger place that will perpetuate the university's existence for the future.